Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 198, we're going to talk about cable specifications and how to test them. And I know this is probably going to be a bit of a boring episode, but stay tuned to the end because we'll be showing off some tubes that we're going to have on our 200th episode sale. Yeah, that's two weeks from now. It's a flash sale that we're just going to do for our viewers. There won't be any email blasts or anything like that. It's, it's meant to be a thank you to everyone out there. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in, when in doubt. Well, when it comes to our systems, we often forget that cables are almost as important as actual components. So what I do is I view our interconnects as though they were a component and design, build them just like I would if I was building one of our kits. In fact, we actually, have a lot of uh, kit prototypes on your development. I mean, how many do I have that are actually mostly constructed right now? Uh, three, four, somewhere around there. <laughs> and we've, we're aiming for what, six prototypes? Yeah, yeah, we're keeping busy. Yeah, so there's going to be some fun announcements in the fall, um, a whole new line of kits. Anyways, I don't want to give too much away. Um, so, what really makes a difference? with cables. Well, like with tubes, it all starts with the data sheet. See, I told you it was going to be a boring episode. Now, let's hope the camera stays focused. So we're just going to look at the Belden Bat data sheet for a cable that's actually going to become a kit cable. This is the 1694F. It's coaxial. The F just stands for flexible. They actually make a standard 1694, which is um, slightly different construction and a little stiffer and it'll also become a kit. So I've just highlighted some key parts here. One of the most important is what is the conductor? Well, it's 19, 19 gauge and it's bare copper. That's really important. A lot of, a lot of coaxial cables uh, are using aluminum some steel. You really don't want any of those. You want bare copper. What else have we got here? Uh, the outer shield. Um, we've got two of them. They're both braided and they're both tin copper and their coverage is 95%, which is absolutely excellent. And let's just flip sheets over here. And this is getting to what we're going to be testing today. So what we've got here is the DCR. Now, what does that mean? That means the DC resistance of the cable, and it's 8.5 ohms per 1,000 feet. And the other really critical, and there's lots of specifications that are important, but these are the two most important. And you can measure these in actually in a finished cable. So we've got the capacitance number, and that's 17 picofarads per foot. Now, with the resistance and the capacitance, depending on your data sheet, they may actually give you um, the capacitance uh, and the resistance up to uh, a thousand meters or a kilometer. Um, or they might do it at a thousand feet, which is what they do over here. And um, if you're comparing uh, cables to cables or cable stock to cable stock, it's important to actually do conversions down to one standard. And I, I actually have my spreadsheet open on my left right now on my laptop. And uh, I've got all of my all of my data off the data sheets for various cables that I work with um, converted over to one standard. So and that's not too hard. What else is in here that's quite interesting? Well, the bend radius is really important for cable stock. And in this case, it's 2.75 inches. So that is as tight a radius as you can bend um, the cable uh, uh, without stressing the cable. Okay, let's do a little bit of testing on the bench and get this a little bit more interesting. <laughs> okay, let's turn things on. 
We're going to use two different testers here. And we're going to use two different cables, just to give you an idea of how this all works. Okay, we've got the lab bench reset. We've got the volt ohm meter set to the ohm function. And uh, this is a modern uh, volt ohm meter, so you don't have to zero out the, uh, the ohm function. But if you have an older meter, um, you'll have a little knob that'll let you zero this out. So you would put, the, you would put your leads together, clip them together, and zero it out until you have no ohms showing, or zero ohms. Um, so we're going to test first uh, a Blue Jeans cable. It's the LC1 model. For years, that's all we used in our critical listening system and on our lab benches. And then I had a bit of a problem ordering some more cables from uh, Blue Jeans. And I thought, well, I've always wanted to try my hand at, at designing and building our own cables. Um, and so I, long story longer. <laughs> so I did. And the results were stunning. We actually built better sounding cables um, in house, which is not surprising. We build great sounding kit amps as well. Um, it just takes a little bit of thought. Well, actually, it took me months of thought. <laughs> oh, and, and a lot of work on an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyways, so let's just, tech, just test the resistance. Now, um, the resistance is going to be in two parts. One is the conductor. Now, this is just a standard RCA cable, of course. But if this was a more complex cable, uh, we, would, we might have multiple conductors, yeah? So... Let's just see what the conductor's resistance is. And of course it's very low, like it should be. Now when I'm testing and establishing data sheets, um, I, I use a, a, a really high quality bench meter, which I can't get on camera. So we're gonna use this little guy. And it's a, you know, for the money, these things are really quite good. We use them all the time. We have like a half a dozen of them on our benches at any time. So roughly 0 0.5, 0 0.6 ohms. The cable is roughly uh, three feet or a meter long. My cable is a few inches shorter. So that's nice and low resistance. And let's just check the shield. Now the shield on an RCA cable can perform more than one function, of course, because it is a um, an unbalanced cable, and we, you may well be actually uh, connecting up the grounds through the shield. So, in most cases, both ends are connected. Some cases, just one. Don't get too stressed about that. We're just measuring the resistance of the shield right now, and normally the shield is superior to the conductor. You can see it's the meter is really almost at zero. So that's good. Now, obviously, if you're showing a lot of resistance, you either got a defective cable or a really bad design uh, or bad materials, badly built, who knows? Okay, so let's have a look at one of our own prototypes and see um, how that tests. Okay. Well, why don't you show off the really pretty braid before? Uh, yeah. So it's a, it's very much a coaxial cable underneath that braid, but I've got a couple of sheaths that I use. One looks sort of black, but it's actually sort of a brown bronze color, and one is red. So, uh, and I like them either way. It's it's kind of nice to put the sheath on. Just it's cosmetics, really, but it looks cool, I think. Um, and it stiffens the cable up a nice little bit if you, you know. In a lot of applications, you don't want your cables flopping around. So, you may have noticed that the resistance for the same, roughly the same length of cable, is lower on our prototype cable. And that is because when I was building a whole bunch of prototype cables, I was, I was balancing out the capacitance of the cable, and we're going to test the capacitance in a minute, with the resistance of the cable. And it was my, um, my, my opinion when I started uh, the design build phase of the prototypes that in fact, the resistance might actually be uh, as important or even more important than uh, the capacitance. Now, Blue Jeans focuses the LC1 as a low capacitance cable, and that's kind of where they think it's really important. But if you look at 
the distances our cables typically are. Uh, our maximum cable is 16 feet in our system. Mm -hmm. And that feeds the uh, control preamp over to our mono blocks, which sit right beside the speakers. Um, and um, I measured the capacitance on that 16 foot cable and it really wasn't that significant. And more importantly, the, the DCR or the conductor resistance was extremely low. And um, that's, I think, what makes for superior sound. And as we can see, the, the ground shield or the shield connection on each end were showing no resistance at all. So that's actually superior to the blue jeans cable as well. Now, where the blue jeans cable is going to beat our cable is with capacitance, I'm pretty sure. So let's reset and we'll be back in a second. Okay, we've changed meters. These things are just amazing. They're expensive as all heck, but this will give us a nice accurate measurement. So we're measuring picofarads, which is a very, very low level of capacitance. And what we're measuring is the capacitance between the conductor and the shield. Yeah? Uh, anytime you have two conductors that are insulated from each other and fairly close, you have a capacitor. So that's what we're measuring here. And the other end of the cable is not connected to anything. And it's also not right up against itself because that would affect the, the results as well. Yeah. So we're getting 53.5 picofarads for roughly a meter of cable. Okay. Let's reset and we'll test the blue jeans cable. Okay. So let's get the blue jeans cable on. You, now, Charles just reminded me to make sure to mention to you that when you're measuring low, low capacitance, you can't use, um, you know, something like this or even less expensive uh, volt ohm meters. Um, this is actually our third capacitance meter that we went through to be able to measure these cables, and this is by far the most accurate out of them. Yeah, so unfortunately there is no cheap option for measuring very low um, capacitance values accurately. So I think we were, what, 55.3 or 53.5, something like that. So the blue jeans cable is a little bit lower at 46.2. So with cable design, as in everything to do with audio, whether you're uh, choosing your microphones in the studio or what preamp or what tube to use or what cables to use, everything is a compromise and engineers as well as uh, folks at home who are building a great sounding system uh, are well aware of the fact that you're always balancing some aspect of it and another aspect that maybe you're juggling a dozen things all at once. Um, be careful about juggling a dozen things at once. Uh, <laughs> as designers of audio gear, we try to focus on one element at a time, uh, particularly when we're making changes. Um, and with cables, it's very much the same thing. If you want a very low capacitance cable, you're gonna to start to get more resistance. And the reason for that is that to get low capacitance, you have to do a couple of things, but the primary thing you have to do is the conductor has to become smaller. Yeah, unless you want an extremely bulky, thick cable with a lot of separation between the conductors. Yeah, which is not practical. So as the conductor gets smaller, what happens to the resistance? It goes up. It goes up. And in my opinion, um, the uh, it's important to be really watchful of the conductor resistance as well as the capacitance and I think uh, for our system anyways the balance that we came up with uh, led to noticeably superior sound. I, I think mm -hmm. you were a bit of a skeptic when we did the first yeah. tests in system and then you're like well, I was surprised at the difference that it made. The The lower resistance, even though it was low already with the blue jeans cables, um, uh, it just made a, a difference. Yeah. 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 And so, so low resistance or lower resistance for slightly higher capacitance, it was a good trade-off for us. Yeah. And the interesting thing is both cable stocks are both Belden and they're both actually very similar in construction, mm -hmm. but the blue jeans cable, the LC1 is a custom cable made specifically for uh, blue jeans. And they actually have a whole line of uh, various types of cables. So anyways, um, and you know, if you're located in the US, um, blue jeans is still gonna be, I think a very good option. 
Um, but if you're outside of the U.S., importing from them is, is just, it's just not easy. It's expensive as all heck. Um, so anyways, well, hopefully before long, we're going to have some cable kits available in the store and you can choose your length and your connectors and make it yourself. Yeah, we're hoping to be able to almost give you an essentially infinite control over what your cable length will be and what your ends will be and what your finish will be. Anyways, um, it, it seemed like an easy job bringing <laughs> bring kits to the store. I thought, well, I'll knock this off in a month. Yeah. So that was what six months ago I started. Maybe a little bit longer. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, it it's coming. So hopefully that informs a, a little bit more. Now you can actually, uh, I know it's a bit of an investment, but you can certainly, uh, uh, and I think everybody who takes their audio seriously should have a decent quality volt ohm meter in in the house. These are not expensive. So I think they're 80, 80 or $90, Yeah, something like that, maybe a little less, and they go on sale too. Um, so you can easily measure the resistance of your conductor and shield on your cables and just make sure that that particular spec is good um, and with a little bit more of an investment, you can actually check the capacitances to make sure that that's good as well. Mm -hmm. And you may be surprised, especially if you're running, you know, some wizard cable or something like that, in which, <laughs> you know, there's lots of advertising. It was sold, you know, um, like hotcakes at the last audio show. You may be shocked at the, at the actual testing numbers that that cable is producing. So, um, Anyways, um, it's just another thing to be aware of in your system. Okay, hope that helps everyone out. Now, Charles, uh, what have you got to show us? Ah, okay, let's clear the deck and we'll be right back. Okay, well, some of these tubes we took a look at last week, but we've actually tested them now and wanted to bring them back on camera to tell you how much we, uh, we love these things. In fact, we had so many, we did a marathon testing <laughs> session. I think we spent a whole morning testing EO34s. It's been a while since we've tested that man, uh, this many of them. This is, of course, the RFT EL34. These are all national branded tubes. And, and national is just a rebrander. And um, they, I think they would, they would take contracts to supply um, EL34s or 6CA7s as they're known in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And um, and then they would go to uh, whoever supplied the you know, the best tubes at the best price. And when these tubes were, were bought in bulk by uh, National, um, RFT was one of the last tube manufacturers still making EL 34s. And they were willing to put their label on them. And we get behind them because they're great sounding EL 34s. And you know, with power tubes, it's not just about how a, a power tube sounds. What's really, really important, and a lot of people are discovering this with Chinese power tubes, mm -hmm. is how long do they last? Yeah, and in the case of these RFTs, so we had a large selection set of these to test, and they were all, every single one of them, tested above new old stock for what an EL34 is supposed to test at, by roughly 10 milliamps out of 70 or Let's 60. Let's get the testing numbers up so people yeah. can see. This is how tightly matched these quads are. We've got... 68 milliamps to 70 milliamps here which is essentially exactly the same um, uh, idle plate current and um, which is the standard for testing any power tube and um, the thing about starting with such a high testing number is that even after the tube is broken in and well used, it will still be testing at new old stock levels. Or very close to it, yeah. We have some used examples that are, um, that are just like these that are testing right where a new old stock tube would. Now, why does that matter, Charles? Well, they're going to last a lot longer. They're more reliable. They're going to stay in your system for a long time compared to a more modern tube that's going to fail sooner. Yeah, so what happens with power tubes that kills them more often than anything? They lose their vacuum. Yep. So that a lot of that is due to how the tube, you know, what kind of amp it's in, what your what your mains power, how stable it is. If it's you know, you've got a heavy duty load on your house current that's that's switching your voltage up and down constantly, mm -hmm. or a neighbor is doing that with the street transformer, that can really affect the lifespan of all sorts of electronics. But um, but power tubes get hot. 
and they cycle on and off, expanding and contracting, and that just puts more stress on them over so time. So a well-built, well-designed tube with good gettering uh, will make for a longer life. And if the tube actually doesn't pop early in its life, like a lot of Chinese power tubes do, <clears throat> people have been known to call them firecrackers, <laughs> um, the, um, the, the, the tube will actually still be viable for a long, long time. Now, mu vintage Mullard XF2s are very similar in uh, quality of construction and longevity. We've tested tubes that were clearly used in an amp for, oh, from the evidence of looking at the used tube, they've been in service for a decade. Yeah, yeah, they lived a hard life. <laughs> and they still test more than acceptable. Yeah. Maybe not new old stock, but still very good. Yes. Yeah. So anyways, that's really important with power tubes is how long are they going to last? Yeah, they have to sound good, but it's no darn good to be replacing your power tubes every six months. Especially if you have one tube fail out of a quad and then you have yeah. to try and replace the whole quad. Well, you should always buy a match spare with a quad. That To me, that's just cheap insurance. In fact, my saying is, if you have a spare... You'll never need it. <laughs> Hopefully not, especially not with these guys. Okay, what else have you got, Charles? Well, first, so we did get enough of these in that we were able to make a bunch of new old stock quads, and this is the first tube that is going to be going on sale. Well, I mean, they're all going on sale at the same time, but this is the first one we're showing off here. So we're going to have new old stock quads of RFTs for sale in the store for our 200th episode. And what we're going to do is we're just going to choose one tube that we have decent inventory on, one vintage tube. In each major category. In each major category. We may not have enough tubes. For example, the 12AX7 category, we have some inventory, some really great sounding vintage 12AX7s. But not enough to sell them on sale. No. And not at the prices that we're having to pay for them too. We're getting tighter and tighter on the margins with them. But these you have got quite a few of. Yeah, well we were lucky enough to find a nice big pile of these new old stock a while ago. And these are the Philips Sylvania made 6922s, which of course is just a 6DJ8 type. And I believe the 6922 is a higher spec or higher rated version of it. Yeah, but the differences on the data sheet are very, very small. You'll see sometimes um, uh, amp suppliers telling you that you really need to run a 6922. But if you look at the data sheets, the differences are so close. I can't believe you would design an amp that would be... You know compatible with one and not the other yeah. yeah so it's possible there's something out there in which the 6922 is the only tube will, that will work um but i would personally i would never design equipment that would have that kind of a, a tight tolerance mm -hmm. but either way though these tubes are fantastic they're tight testing they're quiet they're great sounding uh they're one of the one of the great 6922 6dj8 type tubes that are are left out there in any decent quantities at least for us here and uh we've got some beautiful match pairs of them that we're uh, we're going to put on sale as well now we found a bunch of them that were new old stock new in the box new in the sleeve mm -hmm. but we also found a lot that had been bulk packed yeah. so not everybody gets um a nice box like this but you will get an, a, a reasonable box at the very least <laughs> yeah yeah, I think Charles has found us some, we're, we're still doing a test, but we have some in stock yeah. of some miniature nine pin boxes. We've been looking for literally years for a decent uh, box. So I think we found hard one. to find whenever you're looking to spend less than a dollar a box on them. <laughs> yeah, well, who would want to pay more than a dollar a box? Yeah, it's pretty bad. Yeah, especially when you sell thousands of tubes a year. Okay, so we're going to clear the deck and we've got something fun to show you after this. Okay, what fun bit have you got to show us? Okay, well, we actually have a tube packed here, and we have something that's meant to replace that tube packed here. So this is something that I found while digging through our stock the other day, and look at this beast here. This is the 3B28, which is a half-wave rectifier, and, you know, you think half-wave? Well, I need two of them, well, yeah, but... This can do a thousand volts at one amp. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of circuits will run perfectly fine on on a half wave. Um, in audio, of course, we want our power supplies to be full wave. Yeah, uh, just look how beautiful that tube is, though. Like that is built like a tank. It's stunning. That gigantic top cap on there. 
So I don't even think we have these in the store, but we do have a few of them floating around. I don't think anything out there is using them anymore. Do you remember the maximum voltage and current that this thing can handle? Yep, 1000 volts, one amp. So it's, it's quite a bit. But at some point, I don't know if these became rare or if they decided that they wanted to try and make a solid state version of them because somebody did. Here is a, what is that? A Tarzian? I wanted to say Tarzan there, it's close. Well, maybe the Tarzan name was trademarked. <laughs> and let's get that arranged the right way. And what we have here is a solid state version of this tube. That's a direct plug-in, I think. Yep, it's meant to directly replace it. It has all the same specs. Um, I'm not sure what solid state technology they use to make it, but it's got this interesting, almost like cardboard tube wrap around it which is a little odd. And should we pull out what a, a modern diode looks like that has a similar specification? <laughs> yeah, it's, it might be too small to see on camera. <laughs> okay, well, hang on a second. We'll come right back. Yeah. Okay, so this is a modern uh, diode. It's what is actually, this is the actual diode that we use in all of our kit amp power supplies. They're all solid state. Uh, I believe that they actually sound better. If we were building a guitar amp, that would be different. But for home audio, these things are quiet and they're fast. And this is the UF or ultra fast uh, 4007. And it is uh, rated for a thousand volts, one amp. So that has the same rating as this or as this. A little bit different in size. Yeah. <laughs> now, probably if you look deeper into the data sheets, you'd find that the monster probably can handle uh, more surge or something like that. So it's not an apples to apples comparison. So uh, don't start making comments down below that hey, you got it wrong. Uh, it's just meant to be a fun comparison yeah, to, yeah. just to show you uh, how technology has changed and how I think probably one of the biggest things that's happened with technology is miniaturization. Yep. I mean, Charles, before I, I persuaded him to join the, the business. Um, you were you were a computer guy. Yeah, I was doing computer repairs, board level repairs, soldering tiny surface mount resistors. Some software development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what, what happened in the few years that you were, from the time you went to college to the time that you retired in that? Oh, everything completely changed. Yeah. Yeah, probably three or four times over. Yeah, yeah. So, and of course the same thing happened with this technology too. Um, you know, the Silicon Revolution, um, it didn't just affect um, memory chips and processor size and speed, it affected everything. So, I mean, it would be fun if we had a, a, a scrap a smartphone and popped it open. It's just unbelievable <laughs> how miniature the components are. So, but anyways, we're mostly old school designers and builders uh, because we, we basically just design tube gear, um, but we do occasionally take advantage of modern high-tech stuff when uh, it makes sense when it makes sense yeah but, okay you know that being said these tubes really are beautiful <laughs> yeah yeah we might have to make some sort of power supply or something with some w with them someday <laughs> yeah i mean we have thousands of tubes that aren't actually in the store um that are part of our inventory and whenever i need charles for you know to help with something or a, a ask a question um, and I can't find him. I know he's down in our old stock searching, <laughs> sorting, searching. <Yep. laughs> well, if you stay till the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out. And there's a secret code that people have been figuring out. We can reach almost everybody with flat rate, uh, shipping of $20. If you're in a difficult to ship region, like an Island nation or way out in the middle of nowhere, uh, give us a shout before you order because you, you, we may need to use a mail forwarder or some different method of shipping, or we may not be able to reach you, but I would say 99.9% .9 of our customers we get to. And if yours $150 or more after discount, shipping's on us folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim and Charles signing off. Cheers, everyone.